of days remembered, burns a beacon bright and clear, guiding hands and hearts and spirits into faith set free from fear. When the fire of commitment sets our mind and soul ablaze, when our hunger and our passion need to call us on our way, when we live with deep assurance of the flame that burns within, then our promise finds fulfillment and our future can Stories of our living brings a song both brave and free, calling pilgrims still to witness to the life of liberty. When the fire of commitment sets our mind and soul ablaze, when our hunger and our passion need to call us on our way, when we Tony Lorenzen and I'm Peg Kirkpatrick a worship associate at UU Meriden and we're coming to you this morning from the sanctuary at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Meriden and all of us here and at our partner congregation the Mattituck Unitarian Universalist Society are really excited that you've decided to join us this morning this morning we're going to begin a month-long examination of the spiritual theme becoming and we'll do that this morning by taking a look at the Easter story, the Passover story, and the physics of time. Before we get into that, we're going to light the symbol of our faith, the flaming chalice. Holy are the places of memory, the places which have formed us, where we gather the threads and pieces of what we would become. Holy are the places of change and pain, where the rivers of our lives run white and fast, and we hold on, hold on, and grow. Easter tide is here. Oh. 
music thrills the atmosphere. Ah, Join you people all and sing. Alleluia. Love and praise and thanksgiving. Alleluia. Happy Easter! I'm Reverend Tony. Well, I'm Reverend Tony when he was a little boy. In one of my favorite books when I was a little boy, and one of Reverend Tony's favorite books still, is a story called The Velveteen Rabbit. It's about a stuffed animal, a rabbit, who wants to be a real rabbit. And it teaches some really great lessons about becoming. And that's what we're going to learn about this month at churches. The idea of becoming, what we become, how we become it, and things like that. So here's a little piece of the story, The Velveteen Rabbit, so you get the idea of what it is. What is real? Asked the rabbit one day when they were lying side by side near the nursery fender before Nana came to tidy the room. Does it mean having things that buzz inside you in a stick-out handle? Real isn't how you are made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you when a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt? asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up? He asked, or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't often happen to people who break easily, or have sharp edges, or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off, and your eyes drop out, and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all, because once you are real, you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ryan Sempt. I'm a member of UU Meriden and I'm making this video as a part of uh, the April theme of becoming. Uh, it's been a major theme in my life and I was inspired by a series of YouTube videos about people from uh, various groups uh, identifying and busting stereotypes. Uh, they also, you know, you know, uh, mention um, other parts of who they are in addition to being part of that group. Uh, since, you know, April is Autism Awareness slash Acceptance Month, and, uh, you know, I, I was uh, diagnosed as autistic at age 32 in 2013, I decided to uh, make, uh, make, you know, one of my own videos about it. So I'm going to start by uh, busting, uh, you know, some myths from my own experience. Okay. I'm, I'm autistic, but I'm not. I'm autistic, but I'm not a math genius. I'm. I'm autistic, but I'm not just making it up to get away with saying or doing something inappropriate. I'm, 
I'm autistic, but I'm not a Sheldon Cooper clone. I'm autistic, but I don't idolize Temple Grandin. So, in addition to being autistic, what are you? I'm autistic and I'm a nutcall. I'm autistic and I'm an athlete. I'm autistic and I'm bilingual. Hablo español. I'm autistic and I'm proud of who I am. Our stories this morning are miraculous ones. Waters parting to help a people escape from slavery. A man rising from the dead. Stuffed animals becoming real. Time itself, the concept of past and future, perhaps all merely a function of thermodynamics. The point isn't the outrageousness or unlikelihood of these stories. The point is what they tell us about what it means to be human and to struggle with issues of becoming and believing in possibilities, the possibility things will be better and different than they are now. Each of these stories has a theme of rebirth, like the arrival of spring. Each is a story of a people becoming something they once thought impossible. 
A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 2 through 8. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us at the entrance of the tomb? And when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised, he is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Jesus' followers scatter after his crucifixion. They disappear. They're gone. He basically taught people that everyone was acceptable. He basically taught people to care for one another, to seek peace and justice, to do what's right. He was killed by the Romans for being a threat to their empire, because the empire he talked about was something we'd call beloved community. And when it all came crashing down, when a revolution did not take place because of his teachings, his followers vanished. Why wouldn't they? The Romans had killed their leader. They were probably terrified they were going to be crucified next. But then a funny thing happened, which is the story of Pentecost, the Christian holiday that follows after Easter. They were not so afraid all of a sudden, and they were teaching Jesus' message now that he was gone. Lift the lowly, heal the sick, take the side of the oppressed, feed the hungry, fight religious hypocrisy. Oh, and they were disliked as Jesus was disliked. Now, there are many branches of Christianity that are far from this original message of Jesus. There are many branches of Christianity that, for some reason, think Jesus talked about owning guns and voting Republican and hating brown people and despising the poor. Kind of the exact opposite of what he was all about. I was in a conversation last week with somebody who was talking about the difficulty of finding some place to go to church. They'd been raised Catholic and wanted to go somewhere where they heard the message of Jesus. So I told them, only half jokingly, that us Unitarian Universalists may not all believe in Jesus, but if you come hang out with us, you'll be with people who all want to live as Jesus lived and follow the teachings that he taught his disciples. We are all about taking the side of the oppressed, fighting injustices, feeding the hungry, comforting the sick and the dying, reaching out to those who are poor, standing, siding with the marginalized. We may not be Christians, but we try to follow the teachings of Jesus, nonetheless, even if we don't call it that. We have become, us Unitarian Universalists, oddly enough, some of the major proponents of Jesus' message. Our smotly crew of humanists and atheists and cultural Jews and ex-Catholic and practicing Zen Buddhists, our principles and values are the good news of all the world's major traditions, steeped in kindness, compassion, and fairness, and the acceptance of all human beings as equal 
in dignity and worth. A reading from the Passover Haggadah from a version endorsed by the Jewish Federation of North America Rabbinic Cabinet. There arose in Egypt a Pharaoh who knew not of the good deeds of Joseph had done for that country. Thus he enslaved the Jews and made their lives harsh through servitude and humiliation. This is the basis for the Passover holiday, which we commemorate with these different rituals tonight. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and God brought us out with strong hand and outstretched arm. And if God had not brought our ancestors out of Egypt, and we and our children and our children's children would still be subjugated to Pharaoh in Egypt. Even if we were all old and wise and learned in the Torah, we would still be commanded to tell the story of the Exodus from Egypt. And the more we talk about the Exodus from Egypt, the more praiseworthy we are. While the Jews endured harsh slavery in Egypt, God chose Moses to lead them to freedom. Moses encountered God at the burning bush and then returned to Egypt to lead the people out of Egypt. He demanded that Pharaoh let the Jewish people go. That part of our Passover story is best described in the familiar song, Go Down Moses. When Israel was in Egypt's land, let my people go. But Pharaoh hardened his heart and refused to let the people go. And that is why God sent the ten plagues. Following the slaying of the first, firstborn, Pharaoh allowed the Jewish people to leave. The Jews left Egypt in such haste that their dough did not rise, so they ate matzah. And when Pharaoh changed his mind and chased after the Israelites, God miraculously caused the Red Sea to split, allowing the Israelites to cross to safety. And when the Egyptians entered the sea, it returned to its natural state, and the mighty Egyptian army drowned. One thing that's been said about the Passover story is that every generation must come out of Egypt for itself, and so must every individual. There is a scene in the old TV show MASH where Hawkeye, one of the main characters in this military uh, surgical hospital sitcom uh, set in the time of the Korean conflict, is, uh, says there's only been one war, only ever been one war. When it's finished, they just move it around somewhere else. And doesn't that seem like it? As we hear the Passover story, the story of the Exodus, we think there really hasn't been a time in human history without tyrants, without violence, without intolerance, without persecution of the innocent. And even slavery still hasn't been abolished worldwide in all its guises. Each time in human history has its monsters to deal with, and we have ours. There are still Nazis around, and the religious and politically fundamentalist zealots, the people who would deny other human beings water because they crossed a border or dared to vote. We are called to become the defenders of democracy, freedom, and the very planet on which we live, to defend them from the pharaohs of our time, who would have us all be corporate worker drones, the slaves of old. And individually, we are each stuck in bondage or captivity of one type or another, addiction, physical or emotional illness, all types of neuroses, bad jobs or bad relationships, outdated ideas and outmoded, limited worldviews, discrimination and intolerance, ignorance of evils and oppressions. We all need to find our way to liberation, to a place where we all work to make the world a better place, and we're all proud of who we are, just as Ryan told us this morning. We cannot fix other people. 
we cannot, in a sense, do other people's work of liberation for them. We can inspire each other. We can give each other tools and resources. But we can't fix one another. All we can do is love each other and encourage each other to transform our own lives. A reading from The Order of Time by Carlo Rebelli. This is the disconcerting conclusion that emerges from Boltzmann's work. The difference between past and the future refers only to our own blurred vision of the world. It's a conclusion that leaves us flabbergasted. Is it really possible that a perception so vivid, so basic, existential, any perception of the passage of time depends on the fact that I cannot apprehend the world in its minute detail, on a kind of distortion that's produced by myopia? Is it true that if I could see exactly and take into consideration the actual dance of millions of molecules, then the future would be just like the past? This is time for us, memory, a nostalgia, the pain of absence, but it isn't absence that causes sorrow. It's affection and love. Without affection, without love, such absences would cause us no pain. For this reason, even the pain caused by absence is in the end something good and even beautiful because it feeds on that which gives meaning to life. The emerging theoretical physics of time is a fascinating concept. Time doesn't exist independently of us. We measure its flow from the vantage points of where and when we are in time and space. For astronauts, for example, on an interstellar voyage to the center of our galaxy, moving in a ship at near the speed of light, 21 years passes on ship time until they reach the center of the Milky Way. But here on Earth, tens of thousands of years would have passed. The light we see from the sun left eight minutes ago. There is no universal standard time, or for that matter, any universal daylight savings time. There is no instant of right here, right now that isn't relative to where and when you are. The faster something moves, time slows down relative to a comparison point standing still or moving more slowly. The higher something is, the greater the altitude it's at, time speeds up relative to a comparison point lower or closer to the source of gravity. Carlo Rovelli says, to a large extent, what we call time is our memory, our anticipation. He says, he thinks we're going to understand entirely what time is when we better understand what we as human beings are. And he says that time is an approximate thing, not a fundamental thing, like up and down. Up and down makes sense here where we are, but in the middle of space, it means nothing. Time is connected to heat, he says. You spin a coin on a tabletop, it creates heat and friction by spinning against the table as it moves forward in time and hops and dances on the table. But a video of this can be run backwards. The coin can spin in reverse till it comes to a stop, but there's no heat. It's just an image, a memory. Ravelli says our brains produce heat, our emotions produce heat. If time is connected to heat production, it must be part of the reason why we experience through our brains and our emotions a sense of time. Heat is a description we use for things moving very fast at the atomic and molecular level. Water is hot because its atoms and molecules move rapidly. Water is cold because they move hardly at all. Heat is a place of high entropy things crashing into each other. Cold is a place of low entropy. 
things not moving around so much, staying where they are. The past is cold, frozen. Things don't move so much. The present and the future, especially chaotic, open with the possibility of anything to happen next because things move much faster in the here and now and even faster still in our imagining of what comes next. The physics of time is a fascinating emerging area of study. Now just this week in the murder trial of the person who killed George Floyd, there's an example of why understanding the nature of time and its connection to us in the past is so important. Van Jones said on CNN, when black folks follow the rules and win elections, right-wing politicians refuse to accept the outcome and then change the rules. If this jury now says that police can choke a black man to death in broad daylight, where does that leave us? The system's failing us, and anything we do to fix it from sports figures silently taking a knee to political leaders like Stacey Abrams mobilizing voters is deemed unacceptable. If there is no acceptable road to reform, we're in a very dangerous place. We talk about white rage and angry white men, but some of this rage is actually unprocessed grief at the changing of America. Change is inevitable and hard. Unprocessed grief is very dangerous. There must be a better way forward. History is watching America now, waiting to see if we can make a multiracial democratic republic work in the 21st century. What Van Jones is describing is the cold history and low entropy of the American past. For many people, this past is fixed, stuck, frozen in an ignorant frame of mind and worldview that presupposes the inferiority people of color, anyone who's not a white European. The high entropy and high chaos of an uncertain future is enough for all of us to manage. And one reason hate and resistance to change is so strong, because it makes the past as chaotic as the future. It's easier to hold on to hate than to face the fear of an uncertain future, maybe even worse as it now becomes affected by changing the way we see, interpret, and understand our past as we try to unlearn its difficult, hateful lessons. If we are to forge a future of meaning and consequence that creates beloved community, we must be willing to see possibility instead of fear and anxiety when we look to the future. We are, as human beings, always in a state of becoming. We are always in a process of change. The people we were at the beginning of the pandemic are not the people we are now, nor the people we will be at pandemic's end. And because of this, I believe we must give ourselves permission to dream about what's possible for us to become next. We know we do not want to go back to normal. Normal, as Van Jones explained, does not work for anyone except rich, white, hetero, cis men. We must give ourselves permission to live into the us. You must give your permission to yourself to live into the you that comes out of this pandemic. After having lived in quarantine for a year, what is it you want and need to become now in the time after? We all trap ourselves too frequently in a bondage constructed by doubt and fear and lack of power, our anxieties and our inability to imagine something better. And that's what we need to do. Imagine something better. Imagine what just might be possible. Our congregations are facing the same thing. 
we can trap ourselves in the cold, low entropy past of the way we've always done it. You know, living through the pandemic taught us that if we want to and need to, we can do things very differently. We need to take this attitude with us out of the pandemic and not be afraid to create a congregational life for ourselves that gives us what we want and need in order to create a vital and energized future. We live here in a fantastic moment in between, in between before and after, in between old and new, between limits and possibilities. Let's take advantage of it, like the Israelites who came out of Egypt, to imagine what possibilities they might create and become as a free people. Let's take advantage of this new opportunity like the followers of Jesus who rose out of their fear to spread good news throughout their known world and imagine the possibility that their message might succeed. We are the ones we've been waiting for. And when it gets down to it, we are the only ones in our own way. Let's take this time, this time after pandemic, let's find out what we can possibly become. All that we have been separately and all that we will become together is stretched out before us and behind us like stars scattered across a canvas of sky. We stand at the precipice, arms locked together like tandem skydivers working up the courage to jump. Tell me, friends, what have we got to lose? Our fear of failure? Our mistrust of our own talents? What have we got to lose? A poverty of the spirit, 
the lie that we are alone? What wonders await us in the space between the first leap and the moment we touch down safely, softly on unknown soil? What have we got to lose that we can't replace with some previously unimaginable joy? Blessed are you, spirit of life, who has sustained us, enlivened us, and enabled us to reach this moment. Give us courage in our leaping and gratitude in our landing, and share with us in the joy of a long and fruitful journey together. This morning, we hold especially close to our hearts as we light our candles, Gwen Kilheffer and her entire school community. All those whose lives have been lost to or altered by COVID-19. All those who celebrated Passover this past week. And all of those celebrating Easter today. All those living on the autism spectrum and all of us who need to learn more about autism. All of our transgender family and friends living bold, brave, authentic lives. All those struggling with dis-ease and illness, both visible and invisible. And all those whose lives have been lost and damaged by the evils of white supremacy and patriarchy. We also hold dear to our hearts today all the joys and concerns and prayers and hopes and dreams that have been left unsaid, which are as equally important to this community. Amen. Hey everybody, it's Reverend Tony. Shortly, everyone in both the UU Church in Meriden and the Mattatuck UU Society will be receiving materials about the annual stewardship and pledge drive. So I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about that for a minute. I'm hoping everyone will be generous. I'd love to see us reach a level where we could have 100% participation, that everyone who is able to do so pledges something. Even $5 a month is a $60 a year pledge. And if you can do more than that, please do. And we're very grateful for that. But if everybody could consider at least a $5 a month pledge for a $60 a year pledge, we'd love to have 100% participation. Now to go along with this, I wanna remind you of the congregation's commitment to you. COVID has affected a lot of us financially, including the congregations. If you are someone who's been really affected by COVID financially, or was even struggling financially before the pandemic, I want you to know that the congregation, either in Meriden or at Mattituck, we want to be able to help you if you're struggling. If even that $5 a month is a lot for you to promise, please be in touch with me or someone else you know or trust on our boards and let us know because we have a commitment to be helping you. And instead of you helping the congregation, now's the time for us to also find out what we can do to make your situation better if we can. So when you get those materials, please think about them. You know, the days of a congregation being able to sustain itself completely on annual pledge donations from its members 
are, are probably over unless you have a really large and or really wealthy congregation. But that doesn't mean your pledge is less important. It means your commitment is even more important because the amount we need to make up from pledges to cover our budget, you know, is going to be less the more people can donate. And if we can get to a situation where the fundraising does not just cover our budget, it means we have a chance to use that money to grow in creative ways and try some new things. So as you get that stewardship material this spring, please be as generous as you can. And if a $5 a month commitment is even too much, please be in touch with me because we want to know how we can help you out too. Thanks a lot. We'll see you soon. Our service may be drawing to a close, but there's always coffee hour. Please pour a cup of your favorite beverage and zoom on in. Join us for coffee at go.uucentralct.org slash coffee. That's go.uucentralct.org slash coffee. We'll see you in a few minutes. For the beauty of the earth, for the splendor of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies, source of all to thee we raise this army of grateful praise. For the joy of here and I, for the heart and mind's delight, for the mystic harmony, linking sense to sound and sight, source of all to thee we raise this heart hymn of grateful praise. For the wonder of each hour, of the day and of the night, hill and dale and tree and flower, sun and moon and stars of light, source of all to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the joy of human care, sister, brother, parent, child, for the kinship we all share, for all gentle thoughts and mild, source of all to thee we raise this parting of grateful We've come to the end of our service, and we're very glad you decided to join us this morning, and we're here to celebrate with us. As we end, we put out our flaming chalice, and yet we believe we carry that flame with us in our hearts to inspire us and lead us and light our way into our becoming. Go in peace, holy ones. We'll see you next week.